Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. Every month, we invite an expert to enlighten us on a topic related to our mission. Because Village TV videotapes these presentations, we can share that expertise with a larger audience. We hope you enjoy today's broadcast. Good afternoon and welcome to our Concerned Citizens Thursday afternoon event. I'm Suzanne Modell and I'm currently the president. Um, for those of you who follow Concerned Citizens, usually we have meetings on it the first Tuesday and the third Thursday, but we're now going into the summer, so we have our meeting this afternoon, and our next meeting will not, we do not meet Tuesdays in the summertime. So we're going to have our next meeting and the one after that, the July and the August, will only be like this one uh, at two o'clock on Thursday, the third Thursday of the month. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, who originally was scheduled for February, our Tuesday evening meeting, but she wasn't able to join us due to health issues, so we're thrilled that she could come today. Uh, Marissa Chanchiarulo is, I was going to say, many of you know this, interim dean at Chapman Law School, and that's actually true. She's the interim dean at Chapman Law School, but she has been elevated, just as Mr. Chemerinsky was elevated. She's being elevated to dean of the Western State College of Law, uh, which is a, a college of law very old, very long established in Orange County, uh, over in Irvine. So she's not moving very far away, but she's moving into a permanent uh, and uh, more influential position. Uh, I, <laughs> right, congratulations, Marisa. Um, she received a BA from the Catholic University of America and an MA and a JD from American University. Uh, before coming to California in 2006, uh, Marisa spent 15 years as an immigration lawyer in Washington, D.C. So that's really, I think, important. Actually, there are people who just kind of like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was not able to get a job to, to work for 15 years in Washington, D.C. She had to almost immediately take a job teaching law at Rutgers because no law firm would hire a woman with a young child, even though she was first in her class. So things have improved, and Marissa worked for 15 years uh, in Washington, which I think is really useful before you go in and start telling, uh, teaching law and telling people uh, how, how to do it. Uh, she's taught courses with titles like immigration and refugee law. Uh, civil procedure, and gender sexual orientation and the law. Her publications include articles about the war on terror, sex trafficking, human rights law, and domestic violence. This afternoon, she will speak to us about migrant surges at the southern border. Please turn off your cell phones and join me in welcoming Marisa Chanchiarulo. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very generous um, introduction. Um, I actually, I, I practiced law for five years um, in Washington, D.C. before I started teaching, and the entirety of my practice was immigration law. So I've been um, practicing, uh, either practicing or um, researching and writing about immigration law um, since 1998, or I guess when I was a clinic student in 1997, which is when I did my first cases. Um, so I've seen, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of changes in immigration enforcement, not a whole lot of changes in immigration law, and not a whole lot of change in the polarization of immigration law. So immigration, um, like many um, things, many topics that um, that we see headlines about every day. 
uh, is a very polarized and polarizing issue. And I think that's largely due to the fact that most people just don't understand immigration. It actually is, shouldn't be a polarizing um, issue. Uh, just the way um, you know, economic market forces aren't really polarizing. Um, economics happen according to, cer according to certain theories. Um, it's data-based. You can see trends in markets. Um, and the same thing happens with immigration. And quite often, immigration tracks the economy. What it rarely responds to um, are um, you know, political theater, um, changes in enforcement and policies, um, and um, internal dialogue here in the United States. Um, while we might see more or less activity at the border because of enforcement policies, um, the numbers really aren't changing. And so I'm gonna go through today with you some of the, um, the myths that I think help perpetuate uh, the lack of immigration reform that we've seen in the law. Um, and um, uh, kind of give some ideas and, and look to you all for some, some questions and thoughts about you know, where, where do we go from here. Um, so I, I titled my presentation Sorting the Myths from the Facts because I do think so much of what we read about um, is, uh, or, and, and you know, so much of, 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 of what comprises the dialogue around immigration um, are beliefs in things that actually really are, at the end of the day, myths. So I'm gonna start off with a slide that shows like just kind of real quickly how people enter the United States. So let me just go over to my slides for a second. So people come in um, legally and illegally. Uh, we have um, immigrant, uh, non-immigrant visas, meaning people are just coming for certain purposes. Uh, immigrant visas, another name for that is a green card. And then we have a uh, refugee resettlement. Of course, we also have a lot of unlawful immigration to the United States. So people crossing the border without documentation, um, that's what we're talking about today um, in terms of the border situation. These are folks who are entering at the border. They don't have a visa, so it's called entering without inspection or entering without documentation. Um, people who enter fraudulently, fraudulently um, this happens when people present a document at a port of entry, either an airport or a border crossing, um, and it's just not their, a, a valid document. It's, it's fake or it's someone else's. So those are the way that people come to the United States. Okay, and then we have, um, who do we have in the United States today? A number of different categories of immigrants, starting with our naturalized U.S. citizens. Um, lawful permanent residents or people who have green cards, um, they can be deported uh, for various crimes um, and, and other things. Many of them are not aware of that, but that, that is the case. Uh, refugees and asylees, um, people with temporary protected status. So that's a status that Congress uh, can designate to a particular country or group of countries, usually because of a natural disaster or some sort of conflict that's going on um, in the country. Um, persons on long-term non-immigrant visas, right? So that's one of the ways we saw how people enter legally. Student visas, work visas, um, short-term non-immigrant visas are things like visitor visas if people are coming to visit family or they're here on a business trip, um, short-term visas. Unlawfully present immigrants, um, or other people um, without a legal right to be here um, also comprise, uh, number, uh, I would say, a, you know, kind of a uh, significant group. There are about 12 million. It, it ranges from 10 to 12 million. That number kind of fluctuates from year to year. But about 10 to 12 million undocumented immigrants in the United States at any time. Many of these are people who um, have lived here their entire lives. They've lived here for, you know, since the 90s, since the early 2000s. Usually they came over as children with family members. Um, and this is the group of people who you may have heard called in the media dreamers, right? So people who came as children, um, grew up in the United States, went to school here, 
um, have families here, have US citizen children, often a US citizen spouse, but there's no way for them to legalize their status. And the reason they're called dreamers is because there have been several attempts in Congress since about 2000 to pass what's called the DREAM Act, which would have provided a path to legalization for these folks. So I think that's one of the biggest myths we encounter um, with immigration, right? That um, people say, well, people who are here unlawfully um, have cut the line, right? There's lots of people waiting outside the United States, patiently awaiting their immigrant visa, allowing them to come here as a lawful permanent resident, and these folks just cut the line. And as we'll see today, that's, that's not really true. Um, there's not really a line for them to cut. Uh, there is no line for them to stand in. Um, and uh, the DREAM Act would have been one way for them to kind of get in line and eventually legalize, uh, but Congress has, has never passed the DREAM Act. Uh, so we have people who are now, you know, like, you know, adults, um, I guess, you know, like some of them in, in their 40s and in their 30s, uh, maybe in, even in their 50s, um, who have, li again, lived here their whole life but have no means um, of legalizing their status despite having um, US citizen family members. And the means by which people can become legal in the United States are very limited. Uh, this is pretty much it. <laughs> they can be sponsored uh, by an employer, um, which is a pretty uh, complicated uh, uh, endeavor and it's not available for everyone. Like you can't just kind of like work at a sandwich shop and have the employer sponsor you and you get your green card through your work. It, it's much more complicated than that and it involves, um, in, um, it, it, it's integrated with the Department of Labor um, and you have to show there's actual like need for someone who's not a US worker to be um, in that job. Even if there aren't enough US workers to fill that particular job. Sponsorship by a family member. Uh, this is just like sponsorship by an employer. This is generally only available to people who entered the US legally. So when we think about all of those dreamers out there, they entered without inspection, right? They came in as kids with their family members, no documents, crossed the border, went to school, lived their lives often find out that they're undocumented when they're applying to college or they're going for a driver's license. So somewhere where they either need a social security number or they need some proof of their um, lawful status here. And that's when mom and dad have to kind of tell them, you don't have a birth certificate from the United States. You don't have a US passport. You're not a citizen. Um, and so often it comes as, as a surprise uh, to dreamers uh, that they are uh, not lawfully present. Um, and let's say, because so many of them now are adults with families, why can't their spouse just sponsor them if their spouse is a US citizen? So I'm a US citizen, I, I could sponsor um, a spouse, um, but if my spouse entered the country without inspection, my spouse isn't eligible to apply for their green card in the United States. They can apply for it, but they have to leave the country. The problem with that, it's, it's inconvenient, but there's a bigger problem with it. If a person who has accumulated more than one year of unlawful presence in the United States leaves the United States, they trigger a 10-year bar on re-entering the United States. So you might say, well, certainly that doesn't apply to spouses of US citizens. It certainly does. It applies to everybody. Um, people who are not affected, let's say, for example, instead of coming through the border as a kid, let's say my spouse came on a student visa as a college student and just overstayed that visa. Um, the fact that my spouse entered the country properly means they can apply for their green card here in the United States. He never has to leave the country, therefore he never triggers the 10-year ban. 
So it disproportionately, that law disproportionately affects people who have entered the United States through the southern border, because that's where we see most entries without inspections. And it only applies to people who have that, that inability to apply for a green card in the United States only applies to people who enter without inspection. So this is a good example of an immigration law that the goal of which is deterrence, right? They're saying, OK, we're seeing lots of people coming into the United States through the southern border illegally. So we are going to now make it more difficult for them to become legal. That way, we'll prevent people from coming through the border illegally. Has that worked? No. That has not worked, right? That law has been around since 1995. It went into effect in 1998. It hasn't worked, right? Because once again, immigration is not governed by laws, right? People's ability to come, people's ability to uh, to become legal is governed by laws. But the movement, the things that create um, you know, the push and pull factors um, that govern the actual movement of people um, doesn't respond to those types of laws. Nevertheless, that law has been on the books since 1995 with no end in sight. Uh, one thing they did change um, after I stopped practicing um, so what you'd have to do is, it, back in the day, um, before they changed this part of the policy for enforcing this law, um, I would have to, my, my spouse would leave, triggering the 10-year bar. I would have to file a petition for a waiver of the 10-year bar, saying I'm a US citizen. The fact that my husband's going to be, our spouse, whatever, is going to be outside the United States for 10 years is a significant hardship to me, the US, the sponsoring US citizen. And we would hope that the consulate, wherever he was, approved my waiver. Now, you can apply for the waiver before the spouse leaves the United States and get it approved. But he still needs to go. He still is going to have to leave the United States, wait for an appointment at the embassy or consulate, show them the approval of the waiver and everything else, have everything taken care of there, and then finally return to the United States as a lawful permanent resident. So again, like all these myths, right? A lot of people say, well, they should just, you know, they should just marry a US citizen. The only reason we have all these undocumented immigrants is because they don't want to pay taxes. Not true. There is actually just not a law that allows them to immigrate legally. These are the laws. Um, Self-sponsorship is an alien of extraordinary ability. That's really only going to work for people who are very famous, uh, very um, successful artists, athletes, doctors, that sort of thing. Um, and then there are very limited ways through which unlawful, um, unlawfully present people um, can uh, become legal. Usually, they have to be a victim of a crime. The U visa is for victims of violent crimes. The T visa is for victims of human trafficking. Um, so a number of my clients, um, again, and these are mostly people who've come in through the border, often at times where people were you know, really worried about the number of people coming through the border um, and who then lived you know, productive lives in the United States, have US citizen kids, have been paying taxes, have been working, um, have been involved in their communities, and then the only reason they're able to do anything is because they were the victim of a violent crime. And because of their cooperation with police or prosecutors, they're eligible for a U visa. So very limited ways in which people can immigrate. So we see here just some of the, um, the changes in people coming um, to the United States unlawfully. So when I use the term unauthorized um, immigrants, these are people who are um, either um, entering without inspection, for the most part, or people who are, who are coming in with someone else's documentation. So we can see um, how it went up significantly uh, between 1990 and 2000, and then 2010 it, it reached a peak um, of about 12.2 um, uh, million. Um, we can also see how the um, 
the number of unauthorized um, immigrants in the workforce starts to gradually decline. We see some slight declines. And again, that is tracking the economy, right? So the more jobs that there are here um, that are going unfilled, uh, the more migration we see to the United States. Migration, however, also responds to things that are going on in other countries, right? So that's so the United States, jobs, employment, to a lesser degree, reuniting with family members who are already here, those we call the pull factors. But what about the factors that are compelling people um, to leave their countries and come to the United States? Those are our push factors. Um, often those are economic as well, but certainly civil strife, civil conflict, natural disasters, those things can also um, impact the level of migration to the United States. But for the most part, what we're seeing um, are numbers that track the economy um, on, on both sides of the border. So let's talk about what's going on today, right? Because we're hearing a lot about you know, the surge at the border. I, I had the Orange County Register call me up uh, recently um, to ask about, you know, now that um, you know, these, uh, the, the provisions that were used for three years to uh, the emergency pr provisions to keep people out um, uh, because of COVID, now that they're ending, we're gonna see this huge surge. Right? And my response was, well, what you have to remember is that these provisions were only put in place three years ago. So what we're going to see is a return to the norm. We're not seeing a sudden increase that's different from what we used to see. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that what the COVID era policies did were delay processing for people. They didn't stop processing for people. So you still had people coming, you still had people coming in, um, but the United States was able to keep people out and have the processing ha happen outside the United States. So it was really just a change in how things happen. It was a delay in processing, but we really didn't see a massive reduction um, in the movement of people. Okay. Um, so in the most recent reported quarter, so fiscal year 2022, quarter four, um, the Department of Homeland Security uh, recorded a total of 30.6 million non-immigrant admissions to the United States. Um, so that means people coming on visas. So that's quarter four alone, 30.6 million. So these are people with visas. So we're looking at about 120 million people. Totally normal. That's, that's about typical for people with visas coming to the United States every year. Some of these are short, a lot of these are short-term visas, right? People coming in for a visit, people coming in for a business trip. Some of them are longer-term student visas, but it's a lot of people. A lot of people come to the United States every year. And I think this is what gets eclipsed when we hear about what's going on at the border, right? About this surge, this invasion, these millions of people. Um, 1.6 million people in 2021. That was the high. Um, we were still in COVID times then. So first 18 months of the Biden administra administration, we saw 3 million so we could Average, okay, maybe two million. Maybe we saw two million unauthorized entries to the United States. All right, so when we compare that to the number of people, and this does not include people who are coming in on immigrant visas, right? So all of the people who have been processed abroad for green cards is not included in that 120 million for the year. All right, so when we compare the number of people just coming into the United States on a daily basis, um, the numbers at the border are a fraction of that. They're very small. So why do we hear so much about them? Why is there panic surrounding them? Um, and I think part of what answers that is the immediate impact and the visibility, right? So we're not paying attention to all the flights coming in, um, all the buses coming in, people coming in legally. No one cares. No one thinks about it. But it's happening, 
right? This is just, this is our economy. This is our country. A lot of people come here. A lot of people come in. A lot of people go out. Uh, a lot of people come and do business. A lot of people come and go to Disneyland or go visit family, right? Lots of stuff. So why is there panic around, you know, a million people um, at the border or three million people over an 18-month period? Um, and I think it's because there is an immediate visible impact on the immediate surrounding areas. Um, and people can point to that and say, this is dramatic. This is bad for the economy. It's bad for the society. Schools are crowded. Hospitals are crowded. Um, there's no capacity for these people. We're going to send a bus to Los Angeles. We're going to send buses to New York. We're going to send you know, flights to Martha's Vineyard um, and you know, put people um, in these other places. Yeah. It's all theater, right? It's not changing anything about what's happening on either side of the border or what's happening at the border. But it's very easy to just go to the border and say, look at all these people coming in without authorization. They're gonna come in and they're gonna crowd the schools, crowd the hospitals, crowd everything and not give back. Um, so I think that's in part what we're seeing, right? That's why the Orange County Register calls me up about the border, but they don't call me up to ask me how many people are entering the United States today on non-immigrant visas, because no one cares, All right? Um, you know, uh, a number of the people applying, uh, coming to the border are applying for lawful status. Um, they're applying for asylum. Most of them probably don't qualify. Um, but they are entitled to um, apply for it. Um, they are not entitled to counsel, however. Uh, no one is entitled to representation in immigration court, irrespective of age or disability. Another reason why I think there's a lot of attention paid to what goes on at the border is because of the myth um, that immigrants bring crime, right? And uh, this, it used to be kind of a, um, a taboo thing to say, um, that all changed with the 2016 election um, when uh, then candidate Trump, um, you know, just blatantly um, accused immigrants, particularly those coming in through the border, um, as being rapists and murderers. Um, that is a myth. Uh, the fact is um, that unlawfully present immigrants are actually no more likely, or in fact, they're less likely um, to commit crimes um, than the native born population. Um, now, does immigration and unlawful immigration bring crime? Yeah, smuggling's a crime. Um, human smuggling is a crime. And many people who have to, who come to the United States have to be smuggled into the United States. Um, they pay a coyote for that. Um, there is often abuse of, um, of immigrants who are being smuggled into the United States. Um, so they're often the victims of crime. Um, often at the hands of, of other immigrants, um, but certainly not um, always. Another myth, right, that the immigrants come and take but don't give back, vast majority of people coming to the United States um, are coming to work. Um, and they're actually paying taxes. Um, they're paying payroll taxes. Um, they might be using someone else's social security number, which means that if they're entitled to a refund on those payroll taxes, they're not getting it. Um, so they're paying in, but they're often not even getting the refund that they would otherwise be entitled to. This is another example of a deterrent measure that really hasn't had much of an effect. Okay, people are coming in to work illegally, so we're, they're no longer eligible for social security numbers. That'll stop them. Hasn't worked, right? Because again, people aren't coming because they want to get social security <laughs> their, or their social security number, right? They're coming um, because of desperate economic conditions and they're paying taxes. Um, another myth that gets a, a lot more attention than it deserves um, is that illegal um, immigration, that people are taking jobs um, and depressing wages. Um, they're actually not taking jobs. They're coming to fill jobs um, that our native-born population, our lawful, um, even if not native-born, population cannot fill. Um, we don't have enough people legally in the United States or just in the United States to fill all the jobs that we have here. We have an enormous economy. 
Um, California alone is the seventh largest economy in the world. Its economy is stronger and bigger and more powerful than the vast majority of countries on the planet. Um, there is a segment of the workforce where studies have shown that immigrant wages do depress wages. Um, it's less than 10% of the workforce. Part of what could alleviate that is making it easier to legalize, right? So again, like our, our laws date back mostly to the 1950s. What we saw in the 1980s was an attempt uh, to legalize the, the unlawful population at that time and then say, but we're shutting the door to everybody else. We're going to find employers who hire people unlawfully um, and we're going to make it more and more difficult for people who do come illegally to establish any kind of life here. That's what happened in the 80s, right? And if you think back to that slide a few slides ago, we saw 3.5 million people coming in um, in, in 1990 and how that went up to about 12 million by 2010, that has obviously not had the desired effect, right? And so what we saw from the 1990s forward was just more and more restrictive immigration. So a complete lack of response to the economic forces on both sides of the border um, that compel immigration. Birthright citizenship, and this, this is the last myth I'll talk about. Uh, this, this got some, uh, was popular for a while. I think it's died down a bit, but hasn't totally gone away. Um, there is a, a kind of a small portion of, um, of anti-immigrant folks who wanted to eliminate birthright citizenship because it's a magnet uh, for um, immigration. Um, hopefully, if, if this brief talk today has, um, has you know, kind of gotten this one point across <laughs> is that people aren't coming for driver's licenses, social security numbers, handouts, and certainly not birthright citizenship for their kids. Um, they are coming because of economic factors. They need to work. Um, birthright citizenship, um, so again, you've got this mentality that if we put a restriction on something, make life more difficult for people, that'll keep them from coming. Um, this, however, doesn't affect the actual immigrant. It affects the immigrant's children. Um, our constitution is very clear. It couldn't be clearer that anyone born or naturalized in the United States is a US citizen. The only exception to this is children born to diplomats, because technically they're not born in the United States. Their parents are only are technically on their own country soil when they're here. They have diplomatic immunity. Um, that's the only recognized exception. And those kids are lawful permanent residents when they're born. They're not unlawful. Um, so there is no exception um, under the 14th Amendment. Um, and I think, um, you know, hopefully we could agree uh, that eliminating birthright citizenship would not end undocumented immigration, uh, immigration to the United States. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, just, a, a, you know, a number of myths that I think contribute um, to uh, some of what, uh, of like the panic that we see when there is a surge at the border. Um, there are a number of things going on in Central and South America um, that are contributing, again, to like more um, immigration at this time, but we also saw this in the 80s. That was the last um, really big surge prior to the 2000s. What was going on then, of course? The Central American Civil Wars. All right, so now we've got economic collapse in Venezuela. Um, we have um, gangs. Uh, severe gang violence in the Northern Triangle. Um, we have armed conflict um, in Colombia, um, and, and uh, we have uh, uh, very large, powerful rebel groups um, that are in charge of large portions of the country. 
these are some of the non-economic, but also tied to economics that are compelling um, some of the larger amounts of, of immigration that we're seeing right now. So I will stop there and happily take questions, thoughts, comments. Thank you. Utterly ineffective. It's political theater. Um, so what happens when we have a wall, you may have heard about the floating wall that Texas uh, plans to put on, on um, the Rio Grande. Um, walls send people to deserts. Um, and that's why we've seen upwards of 400 migrant deaths a year of people trying to cross the Sonora Desert to get from Mexico to the United States to avoid the walls. A wall, a floating river barrier, none of this stops the economic factors that compel someone to come to the United States to work. Um, does it make it harder? Yes. It increases the cost of hiring a coyote because they have to take a longer route and it increases the risk that they will die um, on that trip. That's all it does. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your, your talk. This was really uh, enlightening. Let me ask you about the uh, children of illegal immigrants um, and, and their schooling. So <clears throat> any, any child who, has, who is illegal, essentially, can enter public school, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so would you argue that that's the economic burden that people are complaining about then? How, how big a burden is that? It's more of a burden um, in areas that have large undocumented populations. And um, I, you know, would favor ways to offset that with federal funds, right? So, um, you know, I, I think that would make sense. The alternative is to say, well, the kids can't go to school, which is what Texas and I think at one point California tried to do, right? And um, you can kind of think that through a little bit and see why that would be deeply problematic, right? Because not only would you have a bunch of kids running around who are not going to school, um, but it's not changing any of the economic reasons that sent their parents here in the first place. Right, so it's just adding a bigger problem onto an already significant problem, right, of not being able to stay at home in your home country and support your family there, right? So now you're here in a country which is pretty much your only option and your kids can't go to school. And if you have a kid who's now born in the United States and is a lawful permanent, is, is a US citizen, you don't wanna send that kid to school, right? Because the laws that Texas tried to pass would have had would have outed the parents irrespective of the immigration status of the kids right so it's important to remember that many undocumented immigrants live in fear right they send their kids to school but there's always the risk that something's going to happen right that immigration authorities are going to find out about them any interaction with the state heightens that fear um, so, you know, uh, it was a five to four decision, Plyler v. Doe in the 1980s, where the Supreme Court said, as a matter of constitutional equal protection, um, all children, um, irrespective of their immigration status, because the Constitution applies to everybody equally, um, are entitled to a public school education. Um, and does the financial burden fall more heavily in states and areas that have higher undocumented immigrant populations? Absolutely, yes. But you also have to take into account that those folks are paying into the system in many ways, right? They're paying payroll taxes, they're paying consumer taxes. There are ways to fund um, that education. Um, I think we're just not really looking very closely at them or looking for new ways to do it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What is the status of those children during the last administration that were taken from their parents at the border and kept in facilities and the parents went on to some other place?
places. Do you know what the status of those children are? Have they been returned or found by their parents? Many, but not all, have been reunited with family members. So there are children um, who are still separated from family members. Um, not all of the information was recorded properly. Um, so there are children that they were not able to match up with a family member. Um, some of them were returned to their countries. Um, others, I think, are living with family members in the United States. Um, many, um, both, parent, both the, the adult and the child ended up deported, but at different times. Um, I think uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to um, overstate the impact that that's going to have on these kids and their parents going forward. Um, that was, I think, an extreme example of a deterrent, um, something that was intended as a deterrent. Um, that, again, isn't responding um, to what's actually causing people to leave. So if you think about it, and I think this is the part that most of us don't think about, right? Because most of us haven't had to face this, right? But um, maybe many of us have moved somewhere for a job. I moved to California to get a law teaching job. Um, but not everyone has. Um, Unlawful immigrants um, are not just moving somewhere else for a job. They're leaving their country, they're entering another country illegally, um, they're going to a place where they have no support system. Um, you have to think about what would, and, and now they're doing it, they're, they're often leaving kids behind, right, to live with grandparents and things. So you have to think about, okay, maybe we've moved our families for a job, but have any of us had to leave our children for a job? And under circumstances where you may legitimately never see that child for the next 10 years, because we don't have that fluidity of border crossing that we used to in the 80s and 90s. It's become too dangerous to cross the border because of the walls, um, because of the enforcement. So once you come, you stay. So you have to think about, you know, is this person really so much different for me as a person that they would leave their five-year-old and eight-year-old behind to go work? Or are their circumstances so vastly different from mine that that's the only choice they were able, they were able to make? And I think that is a part of the discussion um, that is completely missing from if we can even call this a dialogue on immigration. Yes? Um, what, what are the types of unfilled jobs that the, the immigrants are filling? Uh, many different industries, agriculture, uh, janitorial services, cleaning, uh, landscaping, restaurants, hotels. Um, usually uh, what, unfortunately, the law calls low-skilled um, work. Um, so the United States is more and more a skilled market economy, meaning that the people who immigrate here legally, people who are born here, um, are doing uh, very specialized skilled work, office work, um, you know, that sort of thing, computer work. Um, you know, uh, it's, we're, we're a long way from the time where kids would like go and, and like where kids today like have summer jobs like doing agriculture, right? That doesn't happen today as often as it used to 50 years ago, right? Because our, our skill set has changed um, and the types of jobs that kid, young adults and teenagers are doing and going into adulthood with are much different. So it's left open um, these huge pockets of of labor that need unskilled laborers to fill them. Um, and that's where we see most immigrant labor, um, particularly unlawful immigrant labor. You can get a visa as an unskilled worker to come to the United States and work in agriculture or work in these different in industries. But those visas um, are actually really difficult to obtain and they belong to the employer. So it's not like you just show up 
to the U.S. Embassy in Mexico and say, hey, you know, I, I'm, um, you know, I'm a migrant farmer. I want to go to the United States to work. And you apply for a visa and you get one and you just make your merry way across the border. That's not how it works. Um, it's a very complicated, burdensome, expensive process that's controlled by the employers. Um, so there are, there are visas available. No one uses them. The employers don't even use them um, because it's such a burdensome process. Um, so while there are visas available for those industries and that unskilled labor, the process is just not um, a feasible one for anyone to really use effectively, not for the sheer number of people that we need to fill those jobs. Yes. What is the number, estimated number of undocumented immigrants in the state of California? And how are California employers um, getting around the rules? Like I recall, um, instead of using some kind of uh, nationwide database to clear people, they do accept basically falsified I-9s or something so that people can use false social security numbers. What's going on in California? Uh, California, I'm trying to remember uh, what the latest estimate is. I think California has got um, approximately 3 million of the 12 million undocumented, or I guess we're down to about 11 million right now, 11 million undocumented immigrants. Um, the other big um, populations or states with large undocumented immigrant populations, uh, Texas, uh, New York, um, increasingly it's dispersing throughout um, the United States, but California has, um, I think, the largest per um, capita. Um, in terms of how people are getting employed, what employers are doing, um, often they're not doing much of anything. Uh, you know, it depends on the size of the business. It depends on a lot of different factors. But if you if you talk about like a big business that has like an HR and people are going through very specialized processes, um, usually they're just using um, someone else's documentation. Um, and what will happen is eventually the IRS will send a letter to, let's say it's like Hilton Hotel, right? They'll send a letter to the hotel saying, here's a list of employees whose social security numbers um, that are on your payroll accounts don't match up with the information that we have for that social security number, right? Um, and uh, so what will often happen in those situations is they'll get fired. Um, and then they'll go find work somewhere else, right? Because again, we're talking about like a, a vast economy, right? Not just the United States, which is vast in and of itself, but California is a vast economy. Um, and it's very easy to find work um, irrespective of, um, of lawful status. So if we're talking about a smaller business, they may just not report who's on their payroll. I mean, lots of different workplace practices um, go on. Uh, it just depends on the type of industry and the scrupulousness or lack thereof um, uh, of the people who are running the business. Then, of course, you just have business necessity. You know, if you want to keep your business going, you need workers. And I, I think different businesses will go to varying lengths to make sure that happens. Yes? What are the gross numbers of permanent legally compared to the numbers that are coming in illegally? Um, so permanent, um, in terms of the number of people who become lawful permanent residents every year, I don't actually know that number off the top of my head. Uh, it's about 50-50. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have to look at the Department of Homeland Security uh, puts out statistics every quarter on the number of people who have gotten adjustment of status, meaning a green card. Um, but it's, you know, uh, in terms of all immigrant admissions, I'm trying to think, I was just looking at those numbers yesterday. I don't know if I still have them up. No, I don't. Let me see if it's down here. No, this is, 
unlawful immigration. I'm sorry, I don't have the number for permanent um, immigrants. I think we admit about a million uh, new immigrants legally every year. Yeah, I'm not sure. How, if, so if we're if we're bringing in a million a year, I don't know how many are arriving undocumented a year. Huh? It's it's more than a million. Um, yeah, then it's more than then, then it's forty sixty or something. Yeah, it's more than a million. So hold on, where did my there we go. Uh, I don't know what it's doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I. Yeah, I don't know, but it's um, it's it's not the, the number of people coming in um, illegally is a fraction of the overall number of, of immigration to the United States, both permanent and temporary. Is it one percent or ten percent or fifty percent of overall immigration? Of it's about one percent. The number of unauthorized, unlawful immigrants is about 1% of immigration to the United States. Okay, so we shouldn't even worry about that at all. Correct. What is, what is the big hullabaloo? The impression I get from the news is that Politics. there are millions of people arriving at the border and we are <clears throat> allowing millions of people to go to El Paso and El Paso is saying we can't do anything about it. That, right. That's the, the, because El Paso can't do anything about it. I mean, that's accurate. I don't understand yeah. what's going on in this whole immigration. Well, and, and I, I think it all comes down to all of this, right? Because, you, again, you see people at the border, right? And you can say, okay, and they're coming in illegally, right? So you say, they say, oh, we've got this surge of illegal immigrants at the border. And that's all, that's the, and that's the end of the message, right? Without looking deeper into, okay, well, what does it mean for a million people to come in through the border illegally. It means something very different to El Paso as a city than it does to the United States as a whole. It means almost nothing to the United States as a whole, but it does have a very visible and dramatic impact on El Paso, right? So, but again, that goes back to the restrictions of the immigration laws. And what I, I think um, politicians focus on is the immigrants. And they say, you're causing this problem. You're coming to El Paso. There's too many of you. Get out, right? And what we should be saying is, we actually need you. Why don't we facilitate your entry to the United States so then instead of going to El Paso, you can go to Michigan, where you know the chicken factory is. You can work there, and because you're legal, they can't force you to work and your 13-year-old kid to work 12 hours a day, right? But that's not how our laws work. Our laws focus on and demonize the immigrants who are the last people to have any control over what's going on. Could they decide to just stay home? Yes, but remember what that often means for them, not being able to feed their kids not being able to send their kids to school, having their kids be in danger of forced recruitment by gang members, right? These are really serious issues that these parents are facing. Um, and I think the, um, the rhetoric around immigration kind of assumes that people just like wake up one day and say, hey, you know, I, I'm gonna go cross the border into the United States today. I, I feel like breaking a law. That's not what happens, right? It's, it's a difficult and often dangerous decision um, to come to the United States. And if we're able to facilitate people coming, right, if we look at it as the economic issue that it is, then people come through, they don't even have to go through El Paso, right? They could get a flight, come through the airport, show your visa, come on in, right? then they're not stuck in El Paso. They're not a burden on, on that city. They can go wherever the work is, right? Which is eventually what people do, right? They, they go, you know, wherever the work is. But absolutely, El Paso, um, Texas, California, New York, um, there, there is a burden um, on, on those states. Uh, but it's, 
overall, the economic burden is outweighed by the economic benefits, the economic necessity of immigration. What is the uh, status of the program that the United States is trying to promote in the Central American countries and South American countries? Their economic programs to keep their people there. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think those have been especially effective. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of um, economic upheaval. Uh, for example, Venezuela. Uh, we saw what happened there. That's not just something you can fix with a program, right? And then it, it starts to impact the surrounding countries. Um, Central America, Northern Triangle. Um, you know, Honduras, Nicaragua. When we, um, you know, you've got a situation that is actually exacerbated by immigration laws, uh, where gang members are operating like de facto governments um, in in parts of those countries. Um, a lot of those gang members um, were deported from the United States um, as lawful permanent residents. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of kind of cyclical stuff going on. Um, a lot of the economic, um, uh, a lot of the economic issues we see in Central and South America can be traced to US economic policies that have disadvantaged them in various ways. Um, so there's a lot. I mean, it's, it is, I, I think, I think this, at the end of the day, this is the problem, right? It is a big, multifaceted, complex issue. And, there is this urge to reduce it to it's us versus them. They are the other. They broke the law. They need to leave. And that doesn't actually solve anything about this very complex, multifaceted issue. OK, well, we've got a lot of people engaged here. We're going we're gonna to have two more questions. And then, Marissa, were you willing to stay, right? And, Sure. Uh, so after, uh, there are some people who are waiting, but so uh, we'll have two more questions, and then if you will just wait and go up and see our speaker, she'd be happy to speak with you. Let's talk about solutions. What are our legislatures considering when they talk of reform? Nothing that is currently viable in today's political environment. Um, so immigration reform, uh, attempts at immigration have form, reform have been failing um, since 1995, right? 1995 was the last major immigration act to be passed. It was the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. It was highly restrictive and punitive. Um, attempts to reform that law, so even, for example, just getting rid of that 10-year bar I talked about, have been completely unsuccessful. Um, passing the DREAM Act, which would help arguably the most sympathetic group of undocumented immigrants, right? The ones who came as infants, right? As little kids, unsuccessful despite multiple attempts uh, to, to pass it through Congress. Um, immigration reform is going to have to look at the problem the way it, in, in its reality, right? As an economic situation, um, we are nowhere even close to being able to do that. Um, it is a incredibly highly polarized subject. Um, any legislator uh, who seems, you know, any Republican legislator who seems kind of soft on immigration will be voted out of office. Um, so there is no incentive to do anything about it from a legislative point of view, because it doesn't hurt them, and their constituents don't want them to do anything about it because they don't understand immigration. Um, and there's no legitimate dialogue about it anywhere um, in the media. Um, so I have absolutely no hope of anything even approaching immigration uh, reform in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you.